Good Wednesday evening. It's time for our midweek Bible study. I'm so glad that you're able to be a part of this tonight. I hope this study has been encouraging and uplifting to you. I hope it's a study that will surely help us understand better the living hope that we have. That's what we're studying from 1 Peter and what we've been studying for a few weeks now. I've come to a point in our study where we are in 1 Peter chapter 3, and we're going to look tonight, Lord willing, at verses 18 through 22. That will be um, our focus tonight. And it's interesting because as you look at this section of Scripture um, and, and right in the middle of it, uh, it's, it's considered by many to be probably one of the most challenging uh, passages to interpret uh, in, uh, in, in, in 1 Peter. So uh, we find that there's a lot of different interpretations uh, that have been given about these verses and many uh, different conclusions have, have, been, uh, have come from those interpretations. But... You know, you've heard me say that anytime you study God's Word and, and you take a passage, take that passage in context. You have to look at what's before it, what's after it. You have to understand what's going on uh, around it, who said it, and all those things. So, you know, anytime we're studying, we want to not lift something out of context. And that's what's happened to this section of Scripture so much as people have done just that. They've lifted it out of context and, and, and tried to make it mean what it really uh, doesn't mean. And so hopefully as we study this tonight, we're just going to look at it in its simplicity. And I hope that our conclusion or what we come to in our study is uh, in line with what God wants us to, uh, to know and to understand. But what I want us to do, first of all, is I want us to uh, again, if we're looking at something in context, and if we're looking at verses 18 through 22, uh, let's go back one verse to verse 17 to get some clarity as to as far as what what is Peter talking about? What is surrounding this passage in verses 18 through 22? What is surrounding it, uh, and how will that help us to better understand what we're going to, to look at? So uh, when we go back to our text, we're going to go to 1 Peter 3:17. And there Peter said, For it is better to suffer uh, for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. So, you know, remember that, that Peter's been talking about how we handle suffering. Uh, in our last lesson, we looked at making our suffering uh, purposeful by honoring Christ as holy in our hearts and in and, and, and our suffering and being ready to give an answer to defend the hope that we have despite our suffering. Uh, so Peter has, has been talking about suffering and how we handle that. Uh, we know that Peter's still on the topic of, of suffering in verse 18 of chapter 3 because that verse begins, and, and let me go there, uh, that verse begins with uh, the word for. And we're going to come back to that in just a moment. So, uh, But, but understand uh, what we uh, see here. But I want to jump ahead and look at verse one of First Peter chapter four. So we're looking at before this passage and then after this passage. As we look at chapter four and verse one, notice the topic of discussion. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased uh, from sin. So he says, since therefore Christ has suffered, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. So the topic continues to be the topic of suffering. That's what we uh, find here. So uh, let's um, let's understand and hopefully uh, help us better to see what this um, subject is all about as we look at verse 18 20, uh, through 21 to keep us in the proper context and again to help us have uh, the right understanding that we need to have. So that's that's what we see. We see suffering before, we see suffering after. So 18 through 22 is going to still be in the context of Peter talking about suffering and, and how we handle that and what we need to do. So let's look at our text. Again, verses 18 uh, through 22. Uh, it says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous uh, for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to, to God, being put to death uh, in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Now verse 19 and 20 are the ones that um, we're, 
we find the difficult in, in interpretation, and we'll talk about that tonight. But then in verse 21, he says, Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Now, we use that a lot, uh, verse, uh, 1 Peter 3, 21, in, in talking about the necessity of baptism. And, and I hope it's not that we've ever overemphasized um, that uh, or, or or camped out on, on this. But we're going to talk more about what baptism uh Uh, is all about in just a moment but he says not the removal of dirt from the body but as an appeal to God for good conscience uh, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven as in at the right hand of God with angels authorities and powers having been subjected to him now let me let me read you another translation while you're looking at that another translation of this says for Christ died uh, for uh, sins once for all the righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit, through whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. Uh, In it only a few people, eight in all, it says, were saved through water. So I'm going to stop there. What I want us to understand or see is that the topic of suffering uh, in, in verse 18 begins... For Christ also suffered once for sins. So Peter's telling us and and, and helping us to understand uh, how we handle suffering, uh, how we still have this living hope, how we're to be, how we're to uh, yield, and how we are to act, and what our response to that should be. So when suffering here, what he says is, do not forget that Jesus suffered. Remember what Jesus went through. Jesus suffered. Uh, Now, he didn't suffer because of anything that he had done wrong. He suffered to deal with our sins. Uh, He didn't suffer because of his own sins. Jesus is the righteous. But he suffered because we are unrighteous and needed our sins atoned. And so Jesus died on our behalf. He did it for us. The purpose of Jesus' suffering is to bring us to God. You know, we know sin separates us from God, and and we can't spend eternity with God with our sins or wickedness still attached to us. We we need to separate that. We we are we sin separates us, and and so Jesus died to deal with our sins so that we could be brought to God through His suffering. So the connection is that Jesus suffered for doing good, and we're going to suffer for doing good as well. Now, if you go back and look at 1 Peter 3 and verse 16, that uh, uh, passage reminds us that we will be despised for our good conduct. Well, Jesus was despised too. And Jesus didn't do anything wrong. So Jesus uh, endured the same as, as we did. But before we can, you know, as we go through life and we go through um, challenges in life and suffering in life, before we can have a pity party for ourselves, we have to remember what Jesus did for us. That's why it's so important for us to always remember uh, Calvary. Always remember what Jesus in, in, endured. Uh, so before you know, before we think we're going through so much in our life, I just it's it's terrible. It's it's awful, and I'm, that's not to belittle anybody's suffering and, and struggles. But let's never forget what Jesus has done for us. And I think this is the purpose of of Peter's instructions here. Uh, we will suffer for doing the will of God. But never forget the one we follow also suffered for doing the will of God. And and that suffering was for us. You know, in fact, he was put to death for us. He was put to death and raised from dead so that we would be reconciled to God. Okay, now, we remember Jesus. Remember he suffered for us as we're going through suffering. Now, this is, again, where the interpretations kind of go all over the place. Uh, Some teach um, between the time of Jesus' death. And I'm going to pull it up so you can see uh, verse uh, 19 and, and 20. Um, some some teach that between the time of Jesus' death and the resurrection, he went to the realm of the dead and preached to Noah's contemporaries. There's uh, Another view is, is that Jesus preached to fallen angels, uh, meaning that the spirits in prison are understood to be disobedient angels. And so that's you know, a couple of the interpretations. But Again, it's always necessary to view in context and, and to look at, at 
at the original meaning, the original theme. What do these teachings have to do? And we've already gone to verse uh, 17 and all the way gone down to chapter 4 and verse 1. You know, what do these things have to do with suffering? Because that's the bookends. This is bookended between uh, those two um, verses. And so even if those other interpretations that we mentioned have merit, um, they don't seem to, to fit with this uh, subject of, of suffering. So what is Peter teaching? If those things aren't correct, uh, what is what is Peter talking about? Well, what's the focus of the text? How does suffering fit into Peter's point? Well, think about this. Again, go back to that part of the text. Um, it says, um, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they were formally um, because they formally uh, did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah. Okay, so what's going on in the days of Noah? Well, we, we go back and remember that you know the scriptures declared Noah a preacher of righteousness. You know Noah preached. Uh, I, I've preached for for 20 years of my life. Noah was a preacher of righteousness for 120 years, and only eight responded. Um, <laughs> You're talking about some challenges and some difficulties and some suffering that he probably went through. Not only that, you know, he lived in a day when it, it tells us, the text tells us that the thoughts of humanity were continually wicked. You know, we think we live in an evil time. We live in a time where people just, you know, come up with all kind of crazy stuff. Their thoughts were continually wicked. And so, you know, Noah is preaching uh, during this time, he's he's trying to get people to uh, get on go on, on the ark, and we know the result. Only eight people were saved from God's judgment. But as he went around preaching to people to repent of their sins and and warning them that it's going to rain so much that the earth is going to be flooded, they probably looked at him like he was crazy because he'd never done that before. It never rained before, and so how much ridicule do you think Noah? Uh, Saw that he 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 endured, you know, when he's talking about uh, it's going to flood. And they're like, "What are you talking about, Noah?" And you know how much mockery came as he and his family are building this enormous boat uh, to keep the animals and the and the people on. So you think day after day, month after month, year after year, for 120 years, Noah and his family are building this large boat to save the world from a flood. You think that Noah endured some suffering for that? Well, Christ was preached through Noah to those who chose to be disobedient. And so, you know, I think when we look at this, we understand that in the simplest way to understand the text is to see that, that Jesus went and preached to those disobedient in the days of Noah through Noah himself, and only eight believed. You know, Peter used this language earlier in chapter 1, verses 10 through 12, where Christ spoke through the prophets about suffering and and the subsequent glories of that suffering. So, so kind of look at this, this picture. Jesus suffered for our sins unjustly because he was innocent. He had done nothing wrong. Um, even though he was killed in the flesh, he was delivered by God when he was raised uh, in the Spirit. Noah suffered as a preacher of righteousness. Even though he suffered, he was delivered from the destruction of the earth by the uh, flood uh, through the ark. Uh, so Peter's focus, it seems to be, is on the fact that Noah preached, but many disobeyed, and only a few were delivered. But they were delivered despite the suffering that they went through. Noah and his family were de delivered despite the suffering that they endured from what they were proclaiming, getting people to repent, all these things. So in the simplest form, it, that seems to be uh, what fits uh, the best. So let's move on uh, a little bit and look at the, the last couple of verses. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels and authorities and powers having been subjected to him. Okay, what is it that baptism corresponds to? Well, baptism corresponds to, going back to verses 19 and 20, it goes back to that deliverance. Baptism is, it's, it's, it's not just an external washing. Uh, and, and this is an important statement. Baptism is not some mindless act uh, that we participate in. 
uh, you know, too too many diminish the uh, importance of baptism. But also, let me say this: maybe it is over time that we have over, um, I don't say overemphasized, but we have focused so much on baptism that. I don't want to say we run it in the ground, but I'm trying to think of a way to state it that doesn't sound bad, um, that we've made it some just kind of ritualistic or, or ceremonial act. And, and, and that doesn't sound right either. Just go with me. Um, baptism is, is much more. Uh, it's not the end result. And maybe that's what I was going for. Um, but, you know, we understand that just as much as faith alone does not save, neither does baptism alone save. Now, does that negate how important baptism is? No, it absolutely does not. We know that baptism is essential for our salvation. It's the washing of our sins away by the blood of Christ. We are obeying uh, the command to be baptized for the remission of our sins. But what God asks us to do is He's asked us to, to be changed people, uh, living in the holiness of God, exercising the fruit of the Spirit, if baptism was all that there was for us to do, then the scriptures, you know, didn't need to be so so lengthy. Uh, so let's be, be clear. Baptism is not ritualistic. Just because you're immersed in water does not mean that you're saved. Uh, there's nothing special in the water, the preacher, the words, uh, any of those things. So what is important? What is the point of baptism? Well, when we think about baptism and what we're doing in baptism and how baptism saves us, uh, if it's not some just, you know, ritualistic sacrament, you look carefully, and let's go back, look carefully at Peter's words. What is baptism? Look at um, verse 21. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Now, that that's the essential nature nature of it. We must be baptized for the remission of our sins, going back to Acts 2.38, uh, Mark 16.16. 16, 16. Uh, but here in 1 Peter 3.21, it tells us, it says, look, it's not just washing away of the filth on the outside, but it is an appeal, an appeal to God for a good conscience. We are appealing to God. We are pleading with God uh, in baptism. We're begging God to cleanse us and to erase our sins. So we are asking Him to cleanse our consciences and give us a new life in Him. That's that's a continue, you know uh, that that's even added emphasis as to why baptism is is so important because this is our heart appealing to God as we are surrendering, submitting ourselves uh, to His will. Now let's say this also, you know, baptism becomes a mindless act if the heart is not engaged in what you're doing. It's like uh, as with worship, you know, worship is just empty words, empty offerings, if our heart is not engaged in that. You know, God wants every ounce of us, and He wants our hearts. He, he wants us, you know, from the very, uh, we love Him from, you know, from the bottom of our heart, soul, mind, everything is His. That's what is submitting to Him is all about. But what we're pleading for and what we're asking for is we're asking for that deliverance. We're asking uh, for salvation. And so baptism is how we make that appeal to God's grace for forgiveness. Uh, it's, it's how we call on the name of the Lord. It's, uh, again, baptism alone doesn't save. It's not a ceremonial, ritual, ritualistic uh, thing. Uh, but it is this appeal to God. We are uh, appealing to Him for that um, deliverance that we so desperately need from our sins. And so, you know, we appeal for that mercy and that forgiveness. And so it's it's how the that appeal to God's grace is made. That's what baptism uh, is, is really uh, all about, uh, certainly the washing away of our sins and all that. But it's it's not something that's based on our own righteousness or our own good deeds. It's not a work of, of man. It is a, a, a work of God to cleanse our sins away by the blood of Jesus. But again, it's, it's our appeal to Him. It's our obedience uh, to Him in every way. So baptism is how we ask God for His grace. I guess we could uh, could say, that, uh, say it that way. So now, how does all of this come together? Well, these Christians to whom he's writing to, to whom Peter is writing to in the time of the dispersion, they are 
um, suffering for doing good. And Peter is trying to encourage him. Peter's told him, you keep on doing good even in the face of, of your suffering, even in the face of such adversity. And, and they can do this because he wants them to understand, look, Jesus suffered for your sins. He suffered for our sins. He, he suffered unjustly. Uh, Jesus put his trust in God and it was delivered from death and he was raised to life. Uh, Noah uh, suffered as a preacher of righteousness by those who were disobedient in his day. Noah was delivered from the flood. We are preachers of righteousness to the world who is lost. We're going to suffer for preaching righteousness and we're going to suffer for doing good. Uh, and we may only save a few. But in continuing to do good, Understand, we also experience deliverance and salvation from judgment because we have made our appeal to God for a clean conscience through baptism. Um, and you know, we, we may be in the minority as, as Noah was, but that does not mean that our salvation is not secure. You know, though rejected by the world, just like Jesus and, and Noah were, we are alive to God and know that we are not rejected by Him. That's, in summation, what I think we see in verses 18 through 22. And I hope that gives you encouragement uh, as you continue to move on, as you continue to have this living hope, as you continue to understand your relationship with God and why it is so important to rest on that hope. We're saved by hope. And so uh, we have this living hope in Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, thank you for blessing us, our time together, our study. I hope our time together was beneficial. I hope these things that we've uh, uh, opened up and unfolded and looked at tonight are things that everyone uh, will continue to study for themselves and grow closer to you in every way. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Appreciate you joining us. Hope to see you Sunday morning, 10 a.m. Uh, here at the building. If not, see you online. Uh, and we'll look forward to worshiping with our church family together. Until next time, we hope you have a great evening and great rest of the week.